your Bibles, and I hope you do, open it up to Ephesians chapter 6. The message is entitled, Prepare for Battle. And it's an interesting concept because I know it's a scripture you're quite familiar with and probably have heard many people preach on, and that's because it's a nice one to preach on. And that's why I chose it. But it's interesting because as you get into the book of Ephesians, you see that the Apostle Paul in those first few chapters is writing to the Ephesian church and he's encouraging them on the things that they believe and should be believing. And so those first three chapters are just filled with good doctrinal truths, facts about Jesus, facts about our faith, facts about how we should live. And then the next few chapters are the implications of those things that we believe and what the Christian life looks like. And he talks about husbands and wives and children and fathers and, you know, not to bother your children and raise them up in the admonition of the Lord and so on. And so you see the implications of that. And then he gives this final idea as he's closing out this chapter about this concept of warfare. <clears throat> and I want to bring it up because it's, often misunderstood and misapplied in terms of the understanding of what that warfare is. So first and foremost, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Let's pause there for a second because so we're going to go through that whole armor of God in just a minute and look at a couple of things. One, did you know there's a devil and that he has schemes? If you didn't know that, there, there is a devil and he has schemes. Now, very often we think there is a devil and he's chasing us specifically around. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case unless you're somebody special that he's chosen you out specifically. But he has these schemes and he doesn't have to choose you specifically to choose chase you around because the schemes are rather vast. They're pretty big. The schemes are all out there. Now, you may or may not know this, but the devil has a superpower. How could he know that? His superpower is lying, deception. That is what he does pretty much all the time and only. In fact, Jesus, when he was arguing with the Pharisees, if you remember the last story we were going back and forth with, when they were going back and forth about who's your father, your father's the devil, and they back and forth. He says in that scripture in Matthew, your devil, the father, and he's talking to those people who were not followers of God, was a liar from the beginning, he said. That's what he does. He lies. His superpower is the ability to lie in such a way that people believe him. He's a good liar. In fact, the best of liars. He's been doing it throughout eternity, and he lies wonderfully. So his schemes, if you will, are predicated on, this, on his ability to create illusion and lie and pull you away from what is true. So, one, you need to know that there is a devil and he has schemes. That's what it says right here. But more than that, as you see in the beginning, Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That implication right there should tell you that you, in and of yourself, are not equipped to deal with the devil and his schemes. You're not prepared at all in yourself to actually take on what is really happening in the world on a regular basis. In fact, if you try to do it, you'll mess it up and do it wrong. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might means putting yourself aside and not trying to take any credit for anything that you're doing in terms of success. Paul the Apostle will go on to tell the Philippians in, in chapter 3 of Philippians that he takes absolutely no confidence in the flesh. None. He says, but if anybody thinks they should take confidence in the flesh, he says, I have confidence in the flesh because I was born a Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he goes on to give his entire resume about why he should, if he's going to have confidence in his ability, he was a smart man, he was intelligent, he, could, he, could, he was articulate, he was powerful in the way that he communicated with people, but he took no confidence in those strengths because he walked in the power and the might of God himself. And I want to encourage you this way because I remember being young and all of us, you remember being young. It's 
some of us remember it more than others. But when we were young, we didn't recognize until we got older the kind of strength you had when you were young. I remember being young and just being really strong. And not only was I just really strong because I was a young man, but I was a young man who spent a lot of time in the gym. <clears throat> After I got saved, I needed a hobby. I needed to occupy my time and keep me away from the streets and the things that I was doing. So I just started jumping into just about everything and exercise became a thing for me. So I'd go to the gym and I would work out with these guys with weights and I met a few guys who were bodybuilders and I would work out with them. And they were powerful people. I loved being around them. But there's just, when you're young and you're strong and you can you know, bench press 300, 400 pounds and run around, you can start feeling real confident about yourself. In fact, I remember during that time of my life, a lot of the messaging back then was about having self-confidence, walking out there in the strength that you have and your intelligence, believe in you. That was the message I remember being told me back then. This scripture, being strong in God's power and his strength means my strength at its peak is nothing. I should have no confidence in it at all. In fact, I can tell you, because I've had confidence in my flesh, I have failed in my life, in my spiritual life at times. And I had to grow and understand that believing that it was somehow the willpower I was going to have to keep me away from doing sin. No, that's not how it works. It's being strong in God's strength that gets you through it. I was sharing with our Bible study that whenever you're working with people that are uh, struggling with addictions, and I've come from that world, it's, it's very challenging because it's two steps forward and one step back most of the time. Because those of us who have come from that dark part of the world are struggling constantly with these things in our heads. And there's this, oh, we want this desire for the Lord, but then mm, we slip up and you walk backwards. And in the scriptures in Romans 15 that we we're reading this morning says that those of us with strong faith need to put up and, with, and deal with the people who have weaker faith. We're, we're supposed to be in a place where we're helping them, not helping ourselves. That's what it says. Being strong in his strength, not in your own. We come up short. I always am challenged when I get in front of a group or when I have somebody that comes up in front of a group and starts with their resume about all the great things that they've done and how, how exciting of a person they are and why you should listen to them because they have succeeded in business and they've done these things. Paul the Apostle says of all the things that he accomplished, and he was a very accomplished man, that he counts it as rubbish. It's trash. In fact, the scripture itself teaches that man's righteousness before God is a filthy rag. That's what he says. Amen. So if I take confidence in my flesh that I'm going to go out and do something, we're all in trouble. Be strong in the strength of the Lord. But how do you do that? How do you be strong in the strength of the Lord? Did I get up in the morning and go, is there some special drink I drink? Is coffee the Christian juice up for getting strong? Any strength? No. I will submit to you this idea that being strong in the Lord starts with a confidence in his word. Being strong in the Lord means I have confidence in what he says and what he says I then follow what he says and I'm walking in the strength of his word not in the strength of me being able to do anything. So when his word says, hey, if you are before the Lord and you know that somebody has something against you. The scripture says that I'm to leave my gift there at the altar, go back and reconcile with my brother to make that right before I come before the Lord. Now here's the question. Do we do that? Or do we ignore that part and then come in our own strength to worship before God and keep going while somebody has beef with me or I have beef with somebody else, completely ignoring the word of God. And in that way, I'm not walking in my own strength. I'm walking in God's strength if I go and do what his word says. You're walking in your own strength when you walk by your own opinion. So your strength, in your opinion, is rubbish before the Lord. 
walking in the strength of God then is knowing what his word says and believing it and walking in it. So, walk in the strength of the Lord. That's the first thing. Put on the whole armor of God. That means suit up completely, not partially. And he says that twice, verse 11 and verse 13. He repeats it again, put on the full armor of God. Why the full armor? Well, for those of you who have ever been preparing for battle in the real world, those of you who have been in the services, they equip you with a helmet, they equip you with everything, they equip you with a weapon. If you go out there with only half of your stuff, you know you're not going to last long on that battlefield. You will not be protected. You won't be able to protect yourself. If you walk out there with the full gear to go, but you leave your weapon behind, you're in trouble. If you grab your weapon and leave your protective gear, you're in trouble. You have to fully suit up for a battle or otherwise you're getting taken down. It's just that simple. So the encouragement here, the full armor of God. It's important to be suited up fully, not partially. Partial suiting up creates a problem for you. So we're going to take on the full armor of God. Why? Because one, there's the schemes of the devils and we need to know what to do about that. But more than this, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. You think... That your neighbor next door who's complaining about your dog barking or doesn't like the tree that's growing over the fence or whatever is going on in the community that is that you're having issues with, you think that that's what the battle is. It's not. you got to fully suit up. you got to be in his strength. And you have to know where the fight is. If you're going to be in the fight, you got to be in the right fight. Don't show up for the wrong battle. There's many Christians showing up for this battle. They think they're fighting in their life. Oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to be a successful businessman and I'm going to fight my way to the top. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to show people how powerful I am. That's not the battle. That's not what God, God is not impressed with what you can pull off. He just, think about it. He created the universe. Everything that is seen, everything that is unseen, the things that you haven't even discovered yet, things your brain hasn't even thought of, God has done. And you think he's going to be doubly impressed with your ability to grow a business, to get a better job, to be a whatever, whatever your goals happen to be. You think you're going to put that before the Lord and go, hey, look what all I did with this life. I did a good, good for myself. No. Be in the right battle, number one. Understand that the battle that you're in is spiritual, yet we live in a flesh. And it's interesting because as you look through scripture, you find this interesting concept that there is a real spiritual battle going on that we are not visually aware of, but we're in it. We're experiencing it. In terms of how it plays out in the regular world. If you go to Revelation chapter 12. You see an interesting story in there. About this woman giving birth. And this dragon coming from the sky. And it says that there was war. That broke out in heaven. And you see in the spiritual realm. This poetic picture. Of Jesus' birth. And being taken away into Egypt. And how the devil came down. And tried to swallow him up. And then you read through the gospels. And you see where children were murdered two years and under because they were trying to find Jesus and put him to death. So in the spiritual realm, there's all of this craziness going on that does play out in the physical world, in real warfare. We're not in tune with it if we're not in tune with what God is doing. And if we're fighting the wrong battle and we're suiting up for it, but we're in the wrong battle, you're going to completely miss what God is doing. So what battle is going on that we are experiencing? The devil and his schemes are keeping the world deceived that something else is important for them to put their attention on. And we're in that battle to keep people's attention on who God is and preach the gospel. 
and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus for this world that is passing away. The right battle, the right warfare. <clears throat> we don't fight against flesh and blood. I have had a lot of fights in flesh and blood. I have physical ones, emotional ones, and they're always the same. Somebody gets angry, you said something that was wrong, and then they got hurt, and then you're back and forth, and you, you find this battle that you go in between folks, and yet it goes nowhere. Why? Because it's the wrong battle. It's not what you're supposed to be fighting. We're not supposed to be fighting one another. Over and over, the scripture talks about unity within the body, that we're supposed to seek unity. It says that we're supposed to mark those that create divisions among the body and make sure that what we're always doing is operating in love. In Romans 15, which we were just reading in the Bible study this morning, it says that we're to not just do things to please ourselves, but we're to be thinking about each other all the time. I'm supposed to be thinking about what your needs are. And when I come here thinking about those needs, and I told them how interesting it is, I know that when I was looking for a church, the first thing I started thinking about is, what's in it for me? How's their worship? Does it run the way I want it to run? How's their teaching? Does it, does it do what I need it to do? And I start thinking of all the things that I need. Then I got here and I recognized what God was doing. And what a beautiful thing it is when you just simply allow God to do his thing and you don't try to make it something else. We are in a spiritual battle. And that's a spiritual battle for the souls of human beings. It's a spiritual battle for the souls of people that you and I love. Do not think that that is not a truth. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus says some in an interesting thing. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Wait a minute, Jesus. You're the Prince of Peace. What do you mean you didn't come to bring peace? I thought that's what the whole thing that we sing on, uh, at Christmas time is peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The Prince of Peace has been born here. Didn't you come to make peace? No. He came and he brought us a sword, he said. He said, one that will divide father and mother, households, people will be divided with this sword. Why? Because they're living in a completely different fallen world than we are. We're in it together, but we're not of it. That's what the scripture says. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. This is not our world. Its issues are not our issues. They just aren't. Read the scriptures. And the more you become convinced of what the battle is and where that battle is, all of a sudden your prayers will start to change. Because they'll be towards the people who need to know the truth. So as we equip ourselves... Let's think of a couple of things here. One, we don't wrestle against blood, flesh and blood. And if we do, that's our first problem. But it is definitely authorities, hard stuff, things we can't see, right? Verse 13, therefore, again, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. So there's this whole thing about standing. It's a solidness because it says yeah, you will be able to stand in the evil day. So it's either there is a day that's coming that is evil for you and you'll be able to stand. Or there is an evil day for all of us and we'll stand. Or is it that every day is evil? If you go back over to the fifth chapter of Ephesians, he makes a note that says this. In verse 15, it says, look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Every day is evil. There may be some more particular evil towards you than others where you really need to stand hard because evil feels like it showed up on your doorstep that particular morning. You will be able to stand if you are standing in the right armor of God. So let's take a look at that armor. What we're to be clothed in. Having fast in verse 14, halfway through, the belt of truth. So let's start with the belt of truth. 
Truth is an interesting thing because we think truth is our opinion about a thing. How do you like how he dressed today? You'll get a whole bunch of different opinions about your outfit. That is the truth of what's in somebody's head, but that isn't necessarily the truth. Does that make sense? You have opinions about things that are wrong. I know it's, it's a shock. Some of your opinions are not right on. Some of my opinions, a lot of them, are not right on. But see, it's not about our opinions, it's about truth. Because truth is the thing that we're supposed to have strapped around us. We're supposed to gird ourselves with truth. How do we know what the truth is? How can we know? Well, it starts with knowing where truth comes from. If the devil and his schemes are built on lies, Jesus calls himself what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he said. So truth starts with Jesus Christ. Truth starts with God's word. This is where the truth is. We were just sharing early in Bible study. We can have opinions about all kinds of things, but how do we know when we're correct? When it aligns with God's word. When the truth here is evidenced in our life, we'll know what truth is. We'll walk in that truth. But if you don't know what the word of God is teaching, then you're walking in your opinion. Probably not walking in truth. Be careful. The belt of truth is not just you being honest about how you feel about a thing or your observations of the world and you pulling truth from that. The truth is what God's word says. And once you settle on that truth, that's the truth you walk in. That's why we can walk in his strength. Because his truth overrides the foolishness and the deception of this world. So there is the truth. Having the breastplate of righteousness. So we've got a belt of truth and a breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? Pretty simple. Doing the right thing. Doing what is right is righteousness. If I do things that are right all the time, I'm a righteous person. Californians like that's righteous. I remember back in the day, that was a thing we would tell people. That's a righteous thing you just did right there. A righteous walk and a righteous life are people that are walking in the right way. How do I know it's right? Because here it is. I'm walking in this truth. This is righteousness. I can't walk in my own righteousness. It doesn't work. I don't have any real righteousness of my own. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's my prayer every day. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Wash me of my unrighteousness. Cleanse me from that, please, and give me the righteousness of Christ. Because I need it. It's his righteousness, what he has done, that we walk in. What did he do? He died for our sins. He died so that every reproach that the scripture teaches, every reproach that was meant for us fell on him. And that, that shows God's righteousness. And it's in that righteousness that I stand that you know what Christ died for me and he is my hope. And I can walk in his truth. And we talk about this all the time in Bible study, about that walking in that truth. And what is that truth? If you walk in that truth, you'll have no fear. Why will you have no fear? Because the scripture teaches to not fear the one who can take life from this body, but the one who can take life from this body and eternity. Get your, get your facts straight. There is no fear here. Why? Because my hope is that one day you will plant me in the ground, go have something to eat, and then on the day that God chooses it to be, Jesus is going to pull me right out of that ground and I'm going to be with him forever. That's my hope. Not wishful hoping. I know it's happening. So I can walk confidently in this life knowing that even death itself has nothing, nothing that it can hurt me. It can do nothing to me. A different level of confidence when you walk around, eh, death. So what? That's a new beginning. Righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ that we walk, that, that we keep close to our heart, our breastplate, in the shoes of your feet, having the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Your feet should be wanting to go 
where God wants you to preach the gospel. You should have a preparedness to share, as the, the scripture teaches, reason for the faith that you have. We should be prepared to preach the gospel. You can have a 30-second gospel message where you say, did you recognize that man is being apart from God? He has broken that relationship and God made it right by sending his son Jesus to be a propitiation for your sins. And all you have to do is accept that reality and God will make you a new person. If you want to say it that way, be prepared that way. You want to do something lengthier and do a Bible study, be prepared for that. But you should be prepared to share your faith with other people. That's what it says. Amen. It's what we do. In all circumstances, verse 16, take up your shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, things not yet seen. Faith in what? Proverbs 25, uh, 9, 11, right in there somewhere, says that confidence in a, an unfaithful man is like having a broken tooth or a leg out of joint. <laughs> you can have misplaced confidence and faith in the wrong things. You can say, well, I have faith in myself, beginning of a horrible movie. Oh, I have faith that one day that, that thing is going to happen. Well, how do you know? Has God told you so? You can put faith in the wrong things. People do it all the time. Your shield of faith is one that you're putting in the word of God, which is the truth. See, these, this, this armor builds up on itself. One, you've got to know the battle that you're in. Two, once you have that, that belt of truth, that's God's word, your shield of faith is rooted in this truth. This is where you're putting your faith. Do not put it anywhere else. Do not put it in things you make up. Put it in what God's word says. Your shield of faith, how, how does it extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy? Because he's a liar and we have truth. The more you know the truth and the more you're studying the truth and the more this truth is working its way through you, you can easily go, oh, I don't have to accept that lie. I can walk in the truth. It's extinguished because you have truth. And so your faith is rightly placed. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Why the helmet? Well, if you wear a helmet in, in battle, it's because if something comes this way, it doesn't go through your brain, right? It's supposed to be a deflector. This helmet of salvation is this protection then, if you will, of your mind, of your thoughts. Romans 12.1 is an interesting verse. I want to read it to you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The way the helmet of salvation is understanding God's truth for what it says, believing it, walking in it, and having it on mind all the time, that you're constantly walking through these truths, and it's your helmet that blocks from the enemy coming at you this way that's in your mind. That stops your dumb thoughts from taking you dumb, dumb roads. Because that's what happens. Our thoughts go off into this way and we follow off and we're not following truth anymore. The helmet of salvation is your protection against what is out there that is being aimed right here at this brain. It's interesting that the Bible describes the, the devil as the prince of the powers of the air he's out there in the airwaves creating lies more and more today and here's our last one as I wrap this up because you have the helmet of salvation so your mind is cleared 
The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is where you can speak that truth now that you're knowing. And here's this final one, and we shouldn't neglect this one especially. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with the perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We're to be praying always, constantly, for each other, for everything else. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, in my early walk with Christ, all my prayers were about me. God, please, I need a job. God, please, I need a car. God, please, I need this to happen. Oh, please open this door. Oh, can you make this happen? It wouldn't be a while that I recognize what the scriptures teach, that I'm actually supposed to be praying more for you than I pray for myself. That I'm supposed to be loving God with all my heart, strength, mind, soul, and my neighbors as myself. I should be praying for you regularly. You should be praying for me regularly. We should be praying for each other constantly. Why? Because the days are evil. And I should care enough about you that you would not be caught up in the evil that's out there. And it isn't just to get up here and preach at you. It's to get up here and pray for you. To care for you. To care about what happens in your life. To care whether things are going good. Whether they're going bad. Whether you're walking in truth. Whether you're falling to a lie. These are things that we should be praying about on a constant basis. Amen. As I close with this idea. I find this an interesting text. Because it would be the Ephesian church. That would be the very first church pointed out in the book of Revelation. And it's troubling because as you read through that letter, he says, here's the things you're doing right. And you read through the things they're doing right. You go, yeah, that, these guys are on board. They've got a strong church and they're doing good things and they're making sure truth is there. and They're making sure that these things are happening. And then Jesus says, but I got this one thing against you. You lost your first love. You're doing a whole bunch of things that are right, but you've lost the beginning, the love piece of this. And my encouragement to you, brothers, sisters, in this church body right here, that, that we never lose our first love for Christ and the love that we have for one another. The rest will find its place, I promise you. Equip yourself for battle because we are at war. The war is spiritual. The war is not what you think it is. Don't listen to the messaging that is happening out there about what's important. Get to the word of God and find out what's important. There's people that are dying without Christ. And you have the truth in front of you. God has placed you in front of people to share his love, to share his word, to share his truth. He's equipped you for the battle. Not just preachers that jump up here and give a message. So my prayer for you as we close this out is that you really grab this concept that this is a thing you do daily. You put on that suit every single day. Pray every single day. Understand that what you're walking in is a spiritual battle that has nothing to do with what the rest of the world is saying, but it's for the lives and souls of people that you love. And walk in it. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word that is true. And I thank you, Lord, that indeed we have salvation because you've gifted it to us. We've been given the greatest treasure of all history and all of man's experience. We have been given the greatest gift of salvation. Lord, help us. Help us to preach it. Help us to share it. Help us to go to the people that are around us and let them know who you are, Lord. Equip us each day that we might stand, Lord, because these days are evil. I pray for your body that is here, that gathers. And I ask, Father, for your blessing over their lives. Lord, that you would take away any deception that is in front of them, that they might see your truths that are in your word and walk faithfully in them. Empower your people, Lord. Use us for your glory as you see fit. In Jesus' name.